you can start now. Good morning. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, welcome to the eighth session of the ANCTA Trade Policy Dialogue. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Taisuke Ito from the International Trade Division of ANCTA, and I am the co-organizer of this event. ANCTA Trade Policy Dialogue provides a forum for informal and focused policy discussion, and it represents ANCTA's efforts to improve communication with our member states. Today's topic is trade finance. This is an interesting topic. We know trade is a key enabler of economic growth and post-COVID recovery, and trade finance is essential for trade. Without trade finance, no trade is possible. But within the trade policy community, including in Geneva, trade finance has not been necessarily seen as forming part of a trade policy in a narrow sense. And there has been lack of attention and understanding on this important topic. Given the critical contribution of finance to trade, however, we need to learn more about trade finance, especially how to bridge the growing trade finance gap recently observed under the pandemic, so that trade including essential goods, can keep flowing without interruption. We have a great opportunity today as we have with us a distinguished panel of experts who are deeply involved in practical operations, research, and policy making in the area of trade finance. Now, um, let me inform you uh, that this meeting is organized jointly with GNEXIT and UNDESA, our co-organizers. GNEXIT, is a global network of export import banks and development finance institutions, which brings together certain export import banks in developing countries. It promotes cooperation among its members in South-South trade, investment, project finance. We look forward to this, uh, listening to them and learning from their experience uh, for in the trade discussion. The other co-organizer of this event is the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, UNDESA, especially its Financing for Sustainable Development Office. Uh, every year, ANCTAD cooperates with UNDESA in preparing an annual UN system-wide report on financing for sustainable development. It is our intention to reflect today's outcome of today's discussion in this year's report, which is currently under preparation. At this stage, um, I would like to propose to watch the video messages from our co-organizers. Uh, let me uh, let us first hear the message from the Mr. Lawrence Ajinsam, who is the honorary president of GNEXIT and CEO of the Ghana Exim Bank. Let me share the video. Distinguished representative from UNCTAD member states, distinguished aspects, distinguished Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Global Network of Export and Import Bank and Development Finance Institutions, GenExit, we are pleased to deliver the opening remarks of the 8th Antarctic Trade Policy Dialogue under the theme Trade Finance Under COVID-19 experience of development banks, export and import banks, and export credit insurers in developing countries. We express our appreciation to UNCTAD in partnership with the UN Department for Economic and Social Affairs in organizing the street policy dialogue. As a network of 13 de development banks from the Global South, Jane exit mandate, among others, is to facilitate cooperation among development finance institutions and export import banks in support of South-South trade, investment, and project finance. It is again this background that in April 2020, the network launched a work program dedicated 
Tier 2 Information Exchange and sharing of best practices on measures taken to address the socioeconomic challenges of COVID-19 pandemic on trade finance and project finance. It is in this con context that for intra GNSD dialogue on measures taken by member states and institutions on how to deal with a crisis and series of thematic webinars on related issues were held, including on the impact of COVID crisis on the digitalization of trade finance. Distinguished representative from UNCTAD member states, distinguished experts, ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to note that the key distinguished GNZ members and partners are present in this webinar. We believe that today's dialogue is timely as a robust cooperation of the trade finance community is an essential pillar of the post-COVID recovery. We wish you a fruitful trade policy dialogue. Lawrence Aginsam, Honorary President of Gene Exit and CEO of Ghana Exit Bank. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we do, we do appreciate the close cooperation provided by the Nexus Secretariat in preparing this meeting. Um, now, uh, let us hear our DESA colleague, who is uh, another co-organizer of this event, Mr. Matthew Berogostraete, who is an Economic Affairs Officer at the Financing for Sustainable Development Office in the UN DESA. Hi everyone, my name is Matthew Rosad. I am from the uh, Department of Economic and Social Affairs of the United Nations, also called uh, UNDESA. And I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to uh, send you this short video message. And I'm really sorry I couldn't be there uh, with you and participate live to this discussion. Um, because trade finance is a very important topic to us. Um, as you may know, this topic was included into the um, uh, International Agreement on Financing for Development, agreed by the UN Member States in 2015, called the Addis Ababa Action Agenda. And in that agreement, uh, governments acknowledge that uh, trade finance and the lack uh, of access to trade finance can limit a country's trade potential um, and result in missed opportunities to use trade as an engine for development. So since this agreement, uh, we have been tasked by a government to monitor progress on uh, trade finance um, and develop recommendation on how to address trade financing gaps. And we do this uh, monitoring through uh, our annual publication on financing for development called the uh, Financing for Sustainable Development uh, Report. And uh, this report is produced in uh, close collaboration with many uh, UN agencies, but in particular, uh, UNCTAD and WTO who are leading the uh, trade chapter of this publication. And I want to take uh, this opportunity to thank them for the excellent collaboration that uh, we have had with them throughout uh, the year. So, so unfortunately, uh, as you, I'm sure you're all aware, uh, trade financing gaps have been increasing and are decreasing over time. So there is still a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, at the same time, uh, there are positive development and in particular technology um, is opening uh, ways to maybe address some of these trade financing gaps. Uh, by moving to uh, paperless trade and uh, uh, facilitating uh, trade financing verification uh, processes. So, so we really hope that uh, the meeting that you're having today uh, will help us to, deep, uh, to deepen our analysis on this uh, topic and, and see how we can better improve 
access uh, to, to, to treat uh, finance. And, and we are very eager to build on uh, your expertise and new experience uh, and learn from the action of uh, Exim banks uh, on how to address uh, trade financing gaps and learn what you are doing in this area. And, and this will help us um, identify a solution and recommendation that we could put forward for governments at the annual event on the Forum on Financing for Development that is taking place every year in April and where government discuss issue of financing for development and including trade finance. And, and the recommendation that we are putting in our report on, uh, on the basis for the negotiation of government at this forum and how to steer the global policy agenda on this issue. Um, so it's very important for us, uh, the discussion that you're having today. And, um, and, uh, and I really want to, to thank you for, for the opportunity again and for Ongtad and WTO uh, for the excellent uh, work and for Ongtad for organizing uh, this important event. And uh, I wish you a very fruitful discussion and I'm really looking forward uh, to, uh, to learning uh, from, uh, from what you have discussed today and include that in our next report. So again, thank you, have a great day and uh, bye for now, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so this concludes this short opening segment of this meeting. So now, without further ado, let, let us move to the panel discussion. Um, now, uh, let me give the floor to our moderator, Mr. Ms. Miho Shirotori, who is the head of the Trade Negotiations and Commercial Diplomacy Branch and the Rotating Officer in Charge of the Trade Division of ANCTAD. Over to you, Miho, please. Thank you, Tai. Thank you. I am most honored to, to moderate this discussion on a very important issue. There's experiences of development banks, export, import banks, and export credit insurance insurers in developing countries in times of the crisis. We are with eminent experts of important agencies that are the members of the Gene Exit. Let me first welcome Mr. Tarun Sharma, who is the Chief Financial Officer of the Exim Bank of India. Welcome, Mr. Sharma. We also have Ms. Ankita Pandey, who is Associate with the Trade and Supply Chain Finance Program of the Asian Development Bank. Welcome, Ms. Pandey. And welcome, Mr. Elhaji Ibrahim Chow. I hope, I hope that I'm pronouncing your name right. Um, who is the country sales specialist at the Sub-Saharan Africa and Europe Division of the Islamic Corporation for the Insurance of Investment and Export Credit. Welcome to all you, uh, our panelists. I'm also happy to have Mr. Mark Auburn, who is the counselor at the World Trade Organization as a discussant to this session. Welcome, Mark. Now, um, a more detailed bio of each eminent speaker is available in the website of our meeting. Dear eminent speakers, I'd like to organize this dialogue in two parts, uh, the two set of the questions and answers. The first one would be asking you, what were the main challenges that was brought by the COVID-19 to the world of trade finance, in particular, with respect to the trade finance gap? and what your organization has been doing to mitigate the challenge. And the second question would be on then what kind of regional and international cooperation could support your effort to reduce the trade finance gap. After the second round, I will invite Mr. Mark Oban to comment to, and share his expertise on the issues that have been discussed by our panelists. Dear audience, I also welcome you to provide your comments and questions using the Q&A tab here. And at the end of the, the, at the, towards the end of this dialogue, I would like to address and present these questions to uh, the panelists and the discussant. With this, in order not to lose any time, I'd like to move directly to the first round of the question and answer. Now, Gene exit member agencies like your agencies have been trying so hard to really narrow the trade finance gap, particularly during the COVID-19 situation when 
quite many private financing institutions have left the field, probably in order to, because of their risk averse attitude or, or whatever the reason that happens in the, the crisis. You know, in this context, what, what were the main challenges uh, that the COVID-19 pandemic brought to your operation and how have you been mitigating it? Um, I'd like to start with Mr. Sharma, then followed by Ms. Pandey, then Mr. Cha on this question. So Mr. Sharma, you have the floor. Please go ahead, four minutes, please, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shitori. Uh, I'm delighted to be here and uh, represent uh, the community of export credit agencies, particularly India Exim Bank. And uh, we're a huge economy and a uh, very large country. And uh, when the pandemic did start uh, you know, coming into fore and uh, we, we were a little complacent maybe in the beginning uh, as uh, a people across the globe saying that, oh, this is only local. It is not going to affect uh, communities across and uh, soon we realized that, uh, you know, in March of 2020 came and we realized that, yes, uh, things are looking awkward. Uh, we got into a nation level lockdown. And one of the first things that occurred to us as an institution was uh, uh, business continuity. Should we look at business continuity? Should we look at employee well-being? And what about the businesses that we support? Uh, you know, and in India, uh, uh, exports or trade is contributed uh, very significantly by micro, small, and medium enterprises. And as we reflect today, you know, uh, almost two years since the start of the pandemic, uh, we realize that we're seeing a K-shaped recovery in India, where the large corporates have done better, uh, they've been able to conserve better, but it is really the smaller companies, the MSMEs that have suffered more. Uh, so, you know, when you, when you look back and reflect and you see that perhaps, uh, you know, the concern that we had on MSMEs is, is, uh, was, was absolutely, uh, you know, bang on. Uh, we have uh, uh, Sanketa Pandey also from ADB, and you know, I just thought I'd share a statistic. Uh, uh, so, you know, there was a study done uh, by ADB where they said that the global trade finance gap uh, of uh, 1.5 billion has increased to 1.7 billion. Uh, because of the pandemic. And, and this got us thinking on, you know, what we should do, how we should do th things differently. Uh, the good news was that, uh, you know, people were recognizing uh, the restrictions in the movement uh, by more using digital technology. And, and we saw that not only, uh, you know, some of our large corporates, but even MSMEs who we started handholding look to move towards digital uh, technology and Interestingly enough, you know, even the mom and pop stores that we call Kirana stores in India, they started moving to digital payments and that kept them in good stead. What we also recognized was that, you know, as an ECA in the developing world, uh, we have over the last few decades focused primarily on looking to support medium to long term exports and looking to help Indian companies execute projects over here. But we said now is the time to look at uh, you know what's happening across the nation of uh, helping the smaller companies. So we launched a program called Ubharte Sitare. This was entirely done digitally, uh, no physical uh, you know presence at all. So we uh, worked with industry, we worked with leading academia, including the Indian Institutes of Technology, the Indian Institutes of Management, and also corporates and MSMEs, and and we got feedback from them which helped develop the program. The program is based on three pillars of debt, equity, and technical assistance, and offers support to companies that have a differentiated technology product or process. So what we were really trying to do is that, you know, while uh, not directly looking at trade finance transactions per se, we said, let's step back a bit and try and see whether we can help companies uh, move from their local spaces to become global champions. Uh, in the first year, uh, we supported uh, five companies, and this was across different spaces. So we had uh, companies uh, in uh, the high technology space. Uh, we had companies in the pharmaceutical space, uh, looking at MNRA vaccines, looking at you know uh, uh, providing uh, support for moving uh, products, agriculture products across various spaces. They were solar powered. So. 
you know and and the the beauty of the support was that we saw a lot of these companies can adapt their uh, innovations in other developing countries you know in partner nations uh, like india we see a lot of commonality with our friends in africa and we thought that you know these were simply adaptable technologies uh, now as we are in the second year we've seen uh, you know support uh, leading to over a dozen companies we've got a pipeline of over 100 companies and with the support of the academy what we've seen is that the academy is also coming in and providing support on uh, rigor on prototyping on developing new products so it's it's really trying to see how we can give a boost to the economy by developing this program uh, we also you know uh, we recognize that we are a uh, an institution which provides counter cyclical support so we uh, sat down with the regulator looked at ways and means to uh develop programs to support msmes so there were a number of initiatives taken by not only the government of india but also by the central bank of the country the reserve bank of india and we participated wholeheartedly to see how we can support support some of these companies to come out of the blue to so give them that little uh, a bridge to tide over the problem that worked very well and interestingly enough most of the companies that we supported i think about 95% have been able to tide over their problems and we had very minimal delinquencies because of the counter cyclical support that we provided i'll take a pause here and uh, you know uh, maybe uh, answer a few things a little later thank you very much mr sharma thank you very much mr sharma um for the benefit of time i'm not going to summarize you know your statement or anything and i would like to go straight to ms ankita pandey uh, Mr. Sharma also mentioned that your, you know, your agency's very important role in collecting data on trade finance for, you know, for all the governments and everyone to make the information-based, fact-based uh, decision making. Could you tell us a bit more of where we stand in terms of the trade finance challenge under the COVID-19 with the statistics? Yeah, oh, thanks, Miho. Thanks, Miho. Uh, uh, greetings, everybody. I am Ankita from um, Asian Development Bank. I am a relationship associate with the Trade Finance Program. Um, Stephen, uh, Mr. Stephen Beck, who's the head of our program, couldn't be here because he's uh, traveling back to Singapore. Uh, and as we speak, he must be on his flight. And a special hello to you, Mark. Uh, Stephen uh, mentioned to me to say a special hello to you. So. Uh, he wanted me to pass on uh, his regards to you. Um, so uh, with regards to your question, Miho, and as uh, Tarun correctly uh, pointed out, uh, there was a gap study that was recently launched, that is in October 2021, uh, which uh, tells us that uh, because of this pandemic, uh, not only the uh, global GDP has uh, shrunk to 3.2%, but even the global trade has contracted by 7.5%. And the existing uh, uh, trade gaps have increased to 1.7 trillion US dollars from existing um, 1.5 trillion US dollars in 2015. Now, let us just reflect for a moment uh, what happened in these two years and why the uh, gap increased. Uh, of, of course, it has to be attributed to COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, what primarily happened uh, as per our study was that uh, as the governments were trying to grapple with the pandemic and they were imposing mobility restrictions and like global lockdowns, it was impossible to engage into global trade, right? And because of that, uh, because of that, uh, the country profiles and the counterparty profiles were risk profiles were deteriorating very uh, rapidly. Uh, uh, governments were giving reliefs, uh, banks were provi providing relaxation to the extended loans, uh, leading to weakening balance sheet, you know, increase in uh, non-performing loans and so on. So this uh, uh, led to a building of a perception to say, and not in reality, that uh, banks were very bullish on the perception that there will be a probability of uh, increase in default. Despite all these banks that we spoke to confirming, like majority of them, 70-75% 70, of them confirmed that uh, neither are they reducing the capital allocation uh, against the, these counterparties they work with, nor are they uh, reducing the limits. But the transactions that were being rejected just increased just based on the perception, or as you correctly pointed, uh, because perhaps they were not very uh, bullish on the risk that they wanted to take. So this led to the transactions being rejected. And interestingly, like how Tarun mentioned, uh, the most impacted were the SMEs and women-led enterprises. Uh, as a United Nations SDG mandates, uh, despite we uh, being taking all the measures to uplift the SMEs and uh, women enterprises, these were the ones who were 
uh, the most impacted the banks wanted them to produce collaterals or uh, you know uh, provide a guarantee to their loans which was not possible given the economic uncertainty and these smes and women led enterprises then resort to the informal ways of financing so this is what caused the a uh, gap now uh, what did what did uh, tfp do so just to present one uh, like like a statistic to you uh, in 2020 alone uh, when the global uh, trade uh, volume was growing down, going down uh, tfp saw trade finance program uh, saw an increase in transaction uh, uh, numbers by 50%. However, the value just increased by 7%. What this implied to us was that though the transaction sizes remain smaller or similar to the previous year, that is 2019, we, we still saw a massive increase in the number of transactions that we supported. So we were essentially uh, providing uh, guarantees and LCs to these uh, weaker uh, counterparties who were not able to uh, attain uh, financing without adb support that's that's one and the uh, and in 2021 the trend continued despite uh, uh, in 2021 on the contrary what happened was that not only we saw a good increase in transaction uh, numbers but we saw a massive increase in transaction value which uh, when we spoke to our partner banks which uh, confirmed to us that just by uh, adb being present in the transaction chain and by adb because ADB was providing the support and guarantee to these transactions, the banks were rather comfortable to uh, give some sort of financing to these banks, which are like negatively rated or have, whose risk profile has deteriorated. Second uh, measure that we adopted very aggressively was risk distribution. So the risk that we were taking on, we were further distributing to our risk distribution partners and uh, the risk distribution partners were also comfortable sharing the risk with us uh, just because ADB, sub ADB TFP support is uh, present in the, uh, in the transaction chain. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take a pause here if in case anybody has any questions, but these are predominantly the uh, measures that we uh, took in, during the pandemic. Thank you, Ms. Pandey. Uh, it was a really good example of you know showing how the development bank like yours have been really playing as a safety net in a situation like now when the people are really just suffering from the uncertainty in the future especially in the world of trade thank you now i would like to invite mr um el haji ibrahima chow and you are uh, the, the sort of operating in this area of sub-saharan africa uh, for the Islamic Development Corporation. Would you like to share the, the experiences specific to your operation? Your, you have the floor, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Moreto. And uh, also thank you to Antat Genex Seed uh, for organizing this uh, important uh, session. Uh, I also thank the uh, other speakers, uh, uh, you know, for the brilliant uh, uh, presentation. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I am Mr. Ibrahim Chow. I am representing the Islamic Corporation for Insurance of Investment and Export Credit in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and as you know, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, has been, uh, I mean, uh, uh, deeply affected uh, by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the reason being is that uh, the, uh, most of our member countries here in Sub-Saharan Africa are uh, highly dependent of the importation of essential commodities, uh, health, uh, uh, you know, utilities, and also uh, some uh, energy, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, product that we utilize to to support uh, our industries, our companies, etc. So, I mean, the the COVID nineteen was really a challenge, and um, uh, we have lost uh, many. Uh, I mean, citizens uh, throughout our member countries. Uh, that's the reason why our corporation uh, within the Islamic Development Bank Group has done you know, a tremendous work uh, in order to support our member countries in order to try to minimize uh, the effect of the COVID-19 pandemics. This was done through a program we have established, uh, which is uh, dedicated uh, to support, uh, I mean, in terms of, of coverage uh, to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, mobilize funding uh, through uh, international banks by giving our guarantee. 
in order to, to support the health sector, the agriculture sector, and also the energy sector and the imports of essential uh, goods and commodities. This has been our, our, our operations. And uh, we are very uh, uh, sort of, I mean, uh, 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 proud uh, today to, 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 to be uh, alongside with our member country in this difficult situation. Uh, we, we know that there is a lot more to be done. Uh, we are continuing because uh, uh, we, we think that, you know, the COVID-19 will stay uh, in uh, a long time with us. We have the new variant, which is uh, Omicron, uh, which is also uh, devastating a certain part of, of our member countries. So we are, you know, uh, here to continue to support uh, by providing uh, risk mitigation tools. You know, also there are certain political challenges that are going in some of our member countries. You have heard certainly about the situation in Mali, you know, in Burkina Faso because of, you know, uh, you know uh, terrorist attacks, you know, and, uh, and political turmoils. Uh, but uh, we are developmental institutions and we are here to, to be uh, uh, with our member country in, in, in the time of, of challenges by providing uh, risk mitigation tools, by providing support in terms of mobilizing funding in order to avoid uh, certain disasters that can, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, affect uh, all, all the member countries. I mean, in a nutshell, this is uh, what uh, I wanted to, to, to convey to you as uh, uh, the, the, uh, the challenges we have uh, been facing and also the support we have, uh, we have implemented uh, through a program we call ICERI, uh, which is uh, basically dedicated to, uh, you know, uh, to support the member countries by, uh, by really, you know, uh, reducing uh, the uh, cost of the funding uh, that they are mobilizing through international financial institutions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Cho. You know, it's really excellent to hear from all of you that there have been uh, very useful sort of the risk mitigation tools and operations that you have been implementing. And also, you know, Mr. Sharma, you mentioned uh, this uh, new dimension, new sort of the technological advance in terms of digitalization, like a digital tools, digital payment and so on and so forth could be really contributing to reducing the straight finance gap in the difficult times like now. But as you continue with these mitigation measures and also the normal operation in support of trade finance, what would be your views on what kind of international or regional cooperation could support your operation? Um, could I ask each one of you to give, you know, share your view in two minutes? And this question, I'd like to start from Mr. Chow and moving the other way around from the compared to the first question. Mr. Chow, you have the floor. May I invite you? Yeah, th th thank you very much again. Um, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we think that uh, um, uh, amid this crisis, uh, a single action from uh, any international organization wouldn't be sufficient. I, I think that, you know, this is a world crisis, I mean, a human crisis, and we need to support each other in order to, uh, to address the issue, in order to provide, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, greater, you know, uh, action uh, for uh, for the, uh, uh, you know, the eradication of, of this pandemic. That's the reason why we are very open to collaboration with organization. I mean, it could be Exim Banks, it could be, you know, uh, DFIs. You know, we are we are partnering with, uh, you know, regional institution like Aprexim Bank. We are partnering with you know other you know key partners that have been long-standing partners in the region in order to provide actions that could support the the uh, the, the, the member countries. I think that for us uh, the, the most important uh, uh, action that could be done to 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 you know to support a member countries would be together. I think I mean international organization, DFI should join hand in hand. 
I mean, I, I know that this is this is being uh, I mean, this is being done. Uh, you know, uh, organization like uh, I know uh, Exim Bank India. You know, a ADB. You know, all these organizations are. I I, I see that uh, you know uh, engage on actions that could support the countries that they are relating to, but also other 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 countries. You know, outside the outside the the, the area of operation. And I, I think that this is the way. I, the, the 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 good way that we could I mean implement in order to support the, the member countries because together we can we can uh, come uh, against uh, this pandemic but if you are alone that will be really really challenging I think the action would be uh, you know a joint action to support member countries this is my my point of view on this uh, on this uh, on this point. Thank you very much, Mr. Chow. I couldn't agree with you more on this point. May I invite Ms. Pandey also and then share your view, please, Pandey. Ms. Ms. Pandey, sorry. Thank you, thank you, uh, Miho. So um, I, I agree, agree with uh, what uh, Mr. Chiao earlier said. Uh, it's it's not on one organization as such to you know come up with remedies and we all need to work together on this. However, what, what we think could be done to make a uh, make more resilient trade finance infrastructure is first of all to uh, convince the banking regulators to uh, and to establish to them that trade finance is a very low risk product and the capital allocation should be done accordingly. Uh, what happens is when capital allocation is still done considering trade to be riskier than what it actually is, uh, the banks lose their uh, the banks lose their margin on the returns, and in 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 such uncertain times, it further discourages the partner banks to you know take on trade finance transactions because of high capital allocations and relatively uh, low cost of returns, which further uh, is coupled by onerous and very costly uh, anti money laundering requirements. So some streamlining is required there as well, uh, streamlining the anti money laundering processes, you know. Digit, uh, digitizing and automating, automating them as much as possible so that uh, there are not a lot of costly efforts involved time and again to establish a better suited infrastructure. Um, that's one. Um, second thing is uh, digitization in general can help uh, reduce trade gaps. Um, and But for that, global standards and legislations are required to realize the potential of this digitization process and also a uh, high cost of technological adoption and lack of expertise needs to be addressed if we need to uh, uh, go to that path. So, yeah, I mean, this will be the points from my side on uh, what we could do to uh, address these uh, concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Miss. Thank you very much, Ms. Ankita Pandey. And on this point of AML process and also digitalization, it's really true. Uh, on can we start with a regional cooperation and move to international cooperation? Or do you think it should be really started from like a global type of, of streamlining in your view? What do you think? Um, I mean, in my view, it should be a, a global approach because uh, when, when a certain transaction happens at a trade level on a day-to-day -day level, you are mostly not restricted to regional transactions. The transactions could be from anywhere and everywhere. And if a, a global standard is set if the the protocols and processes are all streamlined then it it becomes much more easier to you know uh, deal on a day to day basis and it it really uh, encourages the banks to support any kind of trade transaction that is feasible to be taken thank you ms pandey thank you now i invite mr sharma to share your view you have the floor go ahead no, thank you. I, I think uh, some wonderful comments uh, on the uh, issue uh, before I just speak. And uh, let me quickly also translate what Ubarte Sitare means. You know, I mentioned about Ubarte Sitare. It means rising champions or hidden champions. Uh, you know, so, so these are the kind of companies that we were looking at. But again, you know, just reflecting back on the trade finance gap. And, uh, you know, when we were again reflecting as the uh, program developed and it, it sort of got some level of maturity, we thought that maybe we should now move into the space of direct uh, support to trade finance. And uh, we, we looked at a lot of uh, multi institutions and regional development banks 
which have their own trade facilitation programs, you know, starting with IFC Washington, uh, ADB, the Inter-American Development Bank, EBRD, and so on and so forth. You know, even some of the regional development banks in Africa, uh, some of our partners like the Afro-Exim Bank and uh, the others. So we have now, uh, we are in the process of launching a trade assistance program. And that's where the cooperation comes in because what we are looking to do is partner with uh, banks overseas, banks and institutions as also those in India. And how do we look at making the marriage happen? Uh, there are a lot of transactions that fall through the cracks and we've seen that uh, discussed right now, particularly during the pandemic. Uh, so we are looking to provide credit enhancement through trade lines on these banks. And uh, as part of our mandate, also looking to coordinate the working of these institutions so that we develop more comfort between them and they can, uh, you know, it supports incremental trade. It also adds more comfort, uh, you know, in, in, the, in these trouble times. So that program is uh, all set to launch in a couple of months. We are in the process of looking at uh, some pilot transactions right now. And uh, of course, uh, uh, digitization or, or digital technology will play a huge role as we go ahead. Uh, the other point I wanted to make was also capacity building. Now, as part of our own endeavor to look at regional cooperation and international cooperation, we've been looking to support institutions in partner countries on looking at capacity development uh, over, you know, using our own experience over the last 40 years. But we're also moving into the space of capacity development with SMEs overseas. And, you know, case in point is a company in Kenya uh, an SME in Kenya that we supported and they were doing uh, uh, excellent uh, manufacturing. So they were in the textile segment. But as the pandemic came up, they started making a lot of, uh, uh, you know, pandemic related to products, you know, PP products uh, that were being used by the locals there. So the way they were able to shift uh, when there is such a need was, was remarkable. Uh, you know, we were surprised ourselves that, you know, the support that we've extended has really gone a long way. So such kind of uh, uh, you know capacity development as we go along, and we've benefited from such capacity development exercises through our partners, and we thought we need to mirror the same. Uh, the last point I wanted to make was again in terms of you know where the markets are, and this is a larger you know in terms of uh, a new uh, exchange that uh, Mauritius was setting up called the Afrinex. Uh, so we've helped. Uh, uh, work with Afrinex, which is supported by the Bombay Stock Exchange. And uh, that exchange has been set up now, and we are the first listers on that exchange. Uh, uh, towards the end of last year, we did our uh, listing, so we are the inaugural listers, and we thought that is another way to encourage more capital flows in addition to you know supporting trade finance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sharma. We have heard so much uh, very important statements, excellent dialogue so far we are having. Now at this stage, I'd like to invite Mr. Mark Oboa to provide your comments, your expertise, views on the, the discussion that we are having so far. Mark, you have the floor. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'll be speaking on my own capacity today as an analyst. Um, yeah, we heard uh, quite a number of elements and uh, trade finance is an area where uh, good numbers are fairly scarce and um, this is particularly why they are valuable. The Global Trade Finance Gap study of the Asian Development Bank uh, in 2021 was particularly welcome and as an economist, um, a few points struck me as being important to, uh, to be noted. The first trade finance gap after having been relatively stable for several years, around 1.5 trillion have risen to 1.7 during the pandemic. And if trade was completely demand driven, one would have expected trade of trade finance gap to have been reduced in connection with lower trade transactions. But what the study said is that rejections have increased as a result of higher uncertainty and risk, as we heard today. And because uh, indeed trade finance supply is sensitive to risk, both country risk, counterparty risk, and risk perception, which is the most important thing during uh, the crisis period and which we have witnessed in the past as well. But second, the gaps uh, affect the smaller traders the most, 40% rejection rate for SMEs around the world and 70 for women-led SMEs. That's, uh, that's striking numbers. Third, 
the poorer the country, the higher the gaps as a share of markets. This is not said explicitly in the ADB survey, but what can derive it from it? Uh, indeed, the rejection rates are the highest from the SMEs, for the SMEs, uh, but since in the poorer countries there's a greater likelihood of, uh, of finding SMEs in the trading scene, then the rejection rate in the poor country are logically higher. Uh, so the ADB survey is also interesting because it brings a lot of the uh, available pieces of information collected during the um, pandemic together. Um, there have been quite a few studies actually public by, published by international organization. I just mentioned here the OECD, the Bank of International Settlements, the IFC, the African Development Bank, all pointing to vulnerabilities in emerging markets during the pandemic. For example, an increase of 30% in rejection rates in the African uh, region um, as per the uh, uh, Joint AFRIXIM and African Development Bank's survey. Now, um, uh, the ADB brings together uh, the pieces uh, remark, uh, re regarding the emerging markets and provide uh, also an interesting picture uh, from a company perspective. Uh, let's not forget that there is a company survey here that provides some qualitative information. Now, of course, trade finance markets have in part in 2021 recovered, uh, particularly in the main uh, routes of trades, um, according to available information. So, uh, and that we heard that before, trade finance, like in uh, many, uh, for many other economic variables and trade variables may be experiencing a sort of K-shaped recovery. Uh, access to international trade finance in low-income countries remain constrained uh, by uh, a worsening of their country's rating, uh, by a higher perception of the counterparty risk which remain, um, that uh, there are also shortages of foreign exchange and tightening of domestic credit at the moment. So it remains constrained when the uh, countries um, in question are not well connected to the rest of the world uh, and to the rest of the international uh, financial system, as was told to me by a, the head of a trade finance program of a multilateral development bank. So the remaining high demand for facilities from multilateral development banks uh, to this day uh, is also an indicator of, of the gap at the lower end of the market. So that's what we know, at least from the different pieces and sources of information. So what's next, if, I, if you allow me a couple of minutes? Um, well, as we heard, um, there is a, a demand for um, cooperation uh, between the actors um, that are on the ground that are providing uh, for risk mitigation and, and support to trade finance. And indeed, instruments have been created by the international community to address some of the gaps that you talked about, the safety net, uh, the trade finance facilitation programs of the multilateral development banks, which are in part counter-cyclical instrument, but be only beware that they're only available in so-called um, IDA countries, which is the poorest countries in the world, and, uh, and many other countries, which may be middle income countries in the world, may not have export credit agencies or similar um, uh, risk mitigating um, uh, institutions. So what is useful during crisis and beyond periods of crisis, because part of the trade finance gaps are, I would say, called structural, is also to have the right analytical tools to understand where the gaps are. Um, this is an ongoing effort by economists to try to develop such tools, uh, global surveys, regional surveys, in a consistent manner, in a consistent manner, and with consistent methodologies. Country gaps are very important uh, to detect because during this crisis there have been a lot of uh, country heterogeneity uh, as useful tools for determining priority action for directing capacity building efforts, economists are working in that direction. So first point. A second important direction of work, and then we heard it also from the speakers, is its dissemination of knowledge and good practices in trade finance. Part of the trade finance gap is a knowledge gap, both on the supply side, that is on the part of financial institution, local financial institutions. And also, um, I think increasingly we recognize it on the demand side, which is on the part of corporates, particularly smaller corporates, which do not necessarily understand how to apply for trade finance to their banks, 
what are the available instruments, um, how to present a proper application uh, and a compliant one. So knowledge about how trade works, uh, how to address the risk of doing trade and to being, uh, being paid on time, uh, which can be actually a, a make or break um, uh, uh, variable for the existence of very existing uh, small SMEs, particularly those who are somewhere in the supply chain, um, uh, have to be addressed. Knowledge about technology, knowledge and then what's available, knowledge about the rules, all of this um, is is uh, uh, is actually uh, an important element, and and as we heard, there are uh, local uh, as well as international efforts to provide for some of that capacity building. There are a number of, of current uh, initiatives, as I said. Uh, we can speak of professional organizations that are very active, the export credit agencies. Uh, um, organization that such as the Bern Union, the Factoring International Association, but also international agencies are providing capacity building efforts. And, um, and uh, so this is the kind of collaborative um, efforts that are being going on uh, in the field. And I would stop here my, um, my presentation. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. I think you have really summarized this nice points and presented like the sort of the strategic orientation in terms of how to improve this. May I put it in this like the way like a global ecosystem for the trade finance in a sense that you know the ecosystem can be developed in a way to help the most vulnerable segments of the economy to participate in a trade in the most equitable manner. Thank you very much. Now, at this stage, we still have time to, to have this uh, discussion more inclusive. So I'd like to ask Tai, uh, what kind of questions or comments that we have received from the floor so far? Can I hand it over to you, Tai? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Miho. So we just uh, received a few comments uh, from the audience. Um, uh, the, let me just uh, outline a few. Um, so there's one question to Mr. Sharma. Uh, the question is asking, uh, what's your view, um, just paraphrase a little bit, uh, what, what's your view uh, in terms of the, uh, the what, what is the con your consideration on the S S sustainable development goal? Uh, for instance, the SDG 8 talks about decent work and the SDG 9 talks about, uh, you know, industry innovation infrastructure. So in your support to the MS, SM, MSMEs, for instance, what's your, um, what your consideration in addressing those SDG targets? And then there was a question to Mr. Chiao uh, regarding his experience in the African context. And he, the question is asking, uh, what is your experience um, in the African continent, especially in the Southern part of the continent, Southern African regions? And, and how, what your, what your advice uh, for those countries to access to the trade finance? So that's the question. And then maybe last question, uh, last few questions. And the other, another question was about vaccine acquisition because someone was interested in knowing what, what will be the support of the, your institution can provide in terms of accessing the vac vaccines, other PPEs in the fight against COVID-19. And the, and the, the re reference is made to the African export import banks. In that context, I think they are, apparently there was support on the procurement of vaccines. But uh, the, so the question is asking what was the experience uh, in the other institutions? And the last question is the, the blockchain technology and smart contract. What, do, what, what, uh, what is your expectation in terms of you know, uh, using those uh, blockchain technology and the smart contract, contracts in risk mitigation in trade finance? So those are some of the questions, maybe uh, for your consideration. Thank you, Miho. Thank you, Tai. So according to the order of the question, may I just start with Mr. Sharma? I'd like to ask you to answer the question specifically made to you and also to other questions on the vaccine acquisition and the blockchain. And then I move to Ms. Anika Pandey for your intervention and also Mr. El Haji Ibrahim, Ibrahim Achao because there was a specific question to you. And Mark, at the end, maybe we would like to share some overview, a summary point from to this uh, the session. So Mr. Sharma, you have the floor. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, fascinating question. You know, uh, it, it's nice that we are looking at this in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals. And SDG 8, uh, you know, 
trade agreements are of course changing course but uh, not merely allowing exports and imports you know uh, if i have to give you example uh, it may not be easy for any country to sign the african continental free trade agreement without acknowledging the work prospects and facilitating exports uh, if you look at it in our own context uh, exim bank of india uh, has engaged with itc geneva and uh, look to support the sita project that is supporting uh, india's trade preferences for africa which was to help uh, economies in africa or companies there really uh, to gain uh, capability to export to india so we looked at a target set of uh, five east asian economies uh, we identified certain companies there and how do we build capability for them to export so this uh, was a pilot project and uh, very very well done along with uh, uh, itc geneva as i mentioned uh, in terms of uh, sdg 9 uh, you know this is industry innovation sector so here uh, exim bank uh, you know we have uh, signed nfta with asean countries now here uh, india has a trade deficit and uh, but it, this is purely based on the, uh, the merits of the goods that get traded india's uh, imports uh, our uh, you know significant amount is industrial and innovation hubs in asean so uh, but if you look at the, what we are trying to support there in terms of our own contribution to innovation uh, industry and infrastructure uh, we've looked at uh, you know uh, power projects transmission line projects taking uh, power to the rural communities in uh, cambodia laos uh, Ma- uh, Uh, Thailand uh, in Vietnam and other ASEAN countries we've looked to uh, you know support uh, uh, some of their waterways uh, by uh, providing uh, petroleum vessels and uh, other water jets uh, going forward i believe it is uh, it will be more balanced that india seeks to sign uh, free trade agreements with uh, you know more advanced economies including the uk and india is a huge market and uh, Uh, today uh, you know under sdg there are uh, there has to be parity amongst all uh, through, SDG, through sdg 9 again uh, you know countries have determined that investing in more resilient infrastructure cooperating across borders and you know that where regional cooperation comes in on the fore encouraging small enterprises all of this is critical to ensure that we look at sustainable industrial development and that's where i you know again give the example of uh, the ubharte satare program that we've developed because we are looking at uh, you know sustainable enterprises and uh, we also have to improve our existing industrial infrastructure and uh, technological innovation will obviously be the key so i have tried to cover uh, more or less uh, you know uh, the point uh, the question raised uh, uh, i will also just quickly move on to uh, you the question on uh, the vaccine acquisition and other pps in the fight against covid 19 now again uh, a very critical uh, point made uh, in these times and we have been working with uh, some of our partner countries in africa uh, we are also working with our partner institutions such as the africa bank the africa financial Co- finance corporation uh, the trade and development bank and we are extending support to some of these institutions to look at uh, sourcing vaccines from india what we are also doing at the india end is to help uh, capacity development uh, so uh, some of these indian companies have been working with uh, you know research agencies and vaccine uh, developers to manufacture on a contract basis vaccines in india uh, there are uh, some who have uh, done original work in, in terms of vaccine development so we have supported them also to further enhance capacity and we are trying to help them uh, supply vaccines to uh, not only the developing countries but also to uh, you know emerging and uh, uh, advanced economies so that that's a huge advantage i did briefly mention about uh, you know the example in kenya uh, where we are seeing a lot of corporates in india as well you know mid to uh, mid sized corporates some of the msmes have moved away from their traditional business to see how they can provide support on pps Uh, interesting enough you will also see a lot of people have moved into uh, you know manufacturing uh, uh, what we have you know in terms of these uh, uh, sanitizers so we we've, we've seen a lot of companies that are in the alcohol space suddenly moving away to manufacture va- va- uh, sanitizers the cost of sanitizers was brought down so some of this i think is happening uh, uh, in india and we are also seeing that it's moving across to some of our partner countries 
Uh, the last point really is on uh, the blockchain technology that uh, uh, Mr. Hitu mentioned. Uh, there, uh, we are seeing increasing use of blockchain te technology across uh, uh, various trade finance areas. Uh, we are seeing platforms being developed uh, both overseas in, in other markets as well as in India. It's uh, maybe a little preliminary now, it's, it's early days, uh, but as we move ahead, I think that there will be a lot more role in terms of, uh, you know, uh, 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 more transparency in terms of looking at AML, uh, in terms of looking at other areas. I think this is this is something in terms of turnaround time. Mark did speak about, uh, you know, how uh, we need to move quickly in terms of, uh, you know, uh, from the time an application is received to moving ahead. And some of these technologies will play a very significant role uh, as we go ahead. The start is here, but uh, we need to do a lot more. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sharma. Sorry, I said Ms. Pandey, but I think according to the question, order of the question, I think it's gonna be Mr. Chow. Uh, Mr. Chow, there was a question with respect to, you know, what kind of program and you have been operating specifically in the Africa region. Are you, shall I just ask you to respond to the question and to others first? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, I think that uh, in the, in the um, in the uh hello hello can can you hear me yes we do hear you yes 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 uh, you know in in the um the mission of the islamic cooperation uh is the uh to support trade and investment in uh in our member countries and from our member countries to the rest of the world uh africa being a key um, zone of our activities uh, we are uh, aware that there is a, a, a gap, you know, in terms of support that uh, uh, banks or and financial institutions in the regions needs uh, from uh, multilateral financial institution to uh, to support trade and investment in in the, in the region. But it, for trade in particular, as this is the topic today, we are we are you know processing a program. Uh, through providing uh, not only risk mitigation tool, but we are providing, you know, uh, uh, how do you say it again, you know, credit enhancement uh, in such a way that we, we, we support the local banks to have more capacity with the international banks when it comes, for instance, to letters of credits or, you know, to any means of uh, or instrument that they are utilizing to support trade in the region. Uh, for instance, if I if I if I take one example, there is uh, one product we are, uh, you know, having which called documentary cred uh, credit insurance policy, uh, which is a, a a trade product that we provide to a confirming bank outside Africa for them to take risk on banks within Africa. Because most of the time, what happens is uh, when, 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 when local banks issue letters of credits, sometimes they are lacking capacity to do more trade because the line that they have with the confirming bank outside Africa are sometimes uh, very, very small and they cannot you know, uh, process all the uh, opportunity of trade that they have. It may be sometimes related to risk that these banks in, in out, outside Africa have on the local banks, you know, but also sometimes it's, it, it, it relates to the, uh, let's say, the, 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 uh, the capacity of the bank itself, because sometimes, you know, the, uh, the capital, I mean, the equity of the bank is too small, uh, not allowing uh, international banks or commercial banks to, to put a lines of uh, uh, confirming uh, on those banks. This is where I say come into the picture in order to provide you know insurance policies that can address the, uh, the, the the lack of capacity that can address the political risk that can occur when there is a transaction related to trade for the country you know to access uh, trade uh, products that are essential for the functioning of the country but also to local banks to continue operating you know, on the, uh, on the trade, uh, you know, area. I mean, this is, this is for instance, uh, product that we can utilize. We are also, you know, supporting 
uh, our local exporters, because most of the most of the time, what happened is they can they can have good products that are needed outside the country, but they don't have you know uh, uh, relate uh, enough uh, uh, let's say insurance to support them to get uh, the, the the money once they export. So this is where we come into the picture to support them to have you know access to other markets in the world but also to secure the exportation when it comes to 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 send the product in in Asia in Europe or in Latin America or anywhere any part of in, in the world so we support them by providing uh, risk mitigation tools and insurance uh, product that can ensure that any export that they do Isaac is there to support them up to 90 to 95 percent of the exports outside, outside, outside the continent. This is, uh, you know, in a nutshell, uh, sort of, I mean, products we are, you know, uh, developing to support, I mean, export but import uh, from Africa and, uh, uh, you know, within Africa. Thank you very much. Um, now it's seven minutes past 11, but let us just say that we can continue up until quarter past 11. Um, so I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Ankita Pandey to, to address some of the questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mimo. So I'd start with the questions on SDGs. Uh, I'm not talking about SDG, any SDG in particular, but um, for Asian Development Bank's uh, trade finance program, it's a mandate to continuously work on uh, um, enhancing the developmental uh, goals that every other uh, country has. And in respect to that, we have several initiatives and knowledge products that we offer to our uh, partner banks. Uh, to name a few would be a gender initiative that we lead and we train our partner banks uh, in enhancing their HR policies in a way that they can um, allow more flexibility to, to their women employees and they could structure their uh, hiring processes in a way that they are able to hire more uh, female candidates. And as a result, a lot of uh, banks have seen um, uh, increasing number of uh, women joining the bank and the gender ratio has really improvised. Uh, if you want, I can share some uh, um, stats later. Uh, the second uh, one would be the initiative that we are running around envir environmental and uh, social management system. So as a part of this initiative, we are training uh, selected, uh, it's a pilot with 10 banks. So we are uh, training these 10 banks to enhance their uh, environmental and social safeguards policies so that they can be better aware about uh, which transactions to take up and which do not uh, to impact the, uh, to not impact the environment and social uh, safeguards negatively. And so, and to also enhance their due diligence policies so that they can be more diligent about uh, the transactions that they deal with and with the uh, parties that they uh, work with. So this is on the SDGs. Uh, there are many more initiatives that I can uh, share, but in interest of time, I'll keep it very brief. Um, on the COVID-19 uh, support related to PPEs and uh, uh, vaccine procurement, first and foremost, uh, I'd like to mention, it's a, I should have mentioned this earlier, um, ADB's Trade and Supply Chain Finance Program has created a tool called COVID-19 uh, a mapping tool. So what, uh, and it's a tool uh, which is publicly available and anybody can use it. You just have to Google ADB Trade and Supply Chain Finance Program COVID-19 Mapping Tool. It's a long name. Um, so uh, with, in this tool, we have uh, tried to map all the uh, manufacturers, uh, suppliers who are into uh, making of vac either the vaccinating, vaccine components like PPEs, syringe, needles, gloves, uh, and vaccine manufacturers to the uh, cold storage uh, distributors and suppliers. You just need to log into the tool and uh, you can either uh, Google the manufacturer you are looking for and you'll find their name, address, or uh, whatever you're looking for, or you can uh, narrow it down by country. And then there is a visual representation of uh, which country has imported uh, a vaccine from which another country. So the import and export visual representation of data is there. Um, it's a it's a very uh, useful tool and a lot of our partner banks have used the tool to reach out to their existing clients to check if they need any financing support. Or a lot of uh, testimonies we have that, I mean, the uh, end user has come and they've told us that uh, with, the, with the help of the tool, they were able to uh, uh, address the shortages that they were facing in their region. 
so uh, the tool was quite a success uh, additionally on the uh, on the business front we have a separate vaccine import facility for our uh, developing member countries using which whenever they have a need for financing for vaccine they can they can use those lines and they can um, avail uh, the vaccine support and this support will be uh, is supported by private uh, public sector as well so there is a vaccine uh, purchase infrastructure set in place and as in when uh, the developing member countries have needed support from us we have been a uh, very uh, proactive to help them so i'll i'll stop here and if it case anybody has any else, other questions i'll be happy to take them thank you very much i would definitely google this covid-19 mapping to i type right after this session so Mark, I, I just like to ask you to give us the final words, your views on well, this. I don't have any pretension to to, pry, to 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 provide final views, but I just like to um, as an analyst to, to remind a few simple uh, realities. First is uh, trade finance is indispensable for trading. Um, trade is integrate integral to the uh, a process of financing um it's not a financing of trade is not a separate activity to trading uh documentation transports merchandise being the collateral uh, of the uh, of trade finance trade finance is part of the trade cycle and whether it is done digitally and it could be done digitally more efficiently uh, by providing for let's say the digitalization of document trade finance um uh, would have to have someone to take the the risk right um so on the one hand yes digitalization can be a, a source of significant um efficiency uh gains uh there are still 60 billion pieces of paper uh which are uh, linked to the documentation related to trade finance and so tra a lot of trade documentation so a lot of this can be eventually uh, digitized. The second thing, though, is despite digitization, someone has to take the risk. It does not uh, match the thing that uh, the exporter wants to be paid before shipment and the importer, importer will only pay uh, after receiving the merchandise to be sure that it has a, the right quality and the right quantity in place. And that digitization does not necessarily uh, provide for an answer to this. Uh, most of the companies in a lot of developing countries are the one to take the risks, not the financial institutions, because they are just not getting trade finance and they are just waiting to be paid when they are shipping their merchandise. And these small companies do not necessarily have the cash flow to, uh, to do that. And then that's my second uh, remark is that uh, trade finance is part of trade costs. I mean, we do not necessarily as analysts associate that to a trade cost, but if you're looking at uh, successful integrators in, in trade in world trade, including the developed countries, they have access to uh, cheap um, uh, trade finance, very cheap actually, um, liquidity at very few uh, basis points. And this is not necessarily the case of the developing countries, which uh, for which uh, an improved infrastructure is probably necessary. And uh, and the last um, and the last uh, reflection from a macroeconomic point of view is that a lot of countries will remain importers of trade finance for a very long time. If you're looking at their savings rates, typically in poor countries, four, five, six percent of GDP, which can be turned into as much in in terms of domestic loans or international loans from their local banking sector, they would have to rely if they have a larger share of GDP in trade to importing trade finance, right? They would be reliance, hence the need for uh, first the domestic improvement in the uh, trade, finance, uh, trade finance infrastructure being attractive to being a, a counterparty to those who will extend, you know, or either endorse the letter of credit or extend uh, the loans um, and hence, uh, the importance of being compliant with international norms and regulation that's that's important but but also probably a need uh, for support as we we heard all the mitigating tools that exist and the capacity building tools uh, that exist to to be also uh, a, a more efficient uh, a local financial infrastructure that is able to um, to to work with the rest of the world as as i said uh, a lot of countries will remain structurally importers of trade finance.
Thank you very much, Mark. And thank you very much to all the panelists for all this information, exciting ideas and the knowledge. So much to digest uh, came up for, from the relatively short session. Thank you very much, everyone. I also want to, uh, to thank all the audience to be with us and participate in this discussion. You know, it has already proven that how important this issue is. As Taisuke said at the very beginning, without trade finance, we have no trade. So we have no United Nations Conference on Trade and Development or World Trade Organization. We definitely let us uh, be part of this global ecosystem of trade finance. As WTO has been, United Nations, uh, as my DESA colleague said, will be there from the intergovernmental uh, point of view on how this multilateral cooperation and collaboration could support your important operation. Just want to say that along this line, this discussion is recorded and will be available on an anchored YouTube for those people who could not be participating in this session to listen to a very important discussion. And also this would form this important elements and inputs to this United Nations Financing for Sustainable Development report of 2022. With this word, I would like to thank everyone and thank you everyone for participating in the trade policy dialogue and um, until the next one, all the best. Thank you so much. The session is closed now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We thank did you. appreciate it. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.